1956. Okay, come on up here. So I heard this during worship. 1956 was a really good year. <laughs> and they usually say that about wine, fine wine, when they say it was a good year, right? And uh, this is what the Lord showed me for both of you. Isaiah 56. This is what it says. Isaiah 56, verse 7. It says, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain. This is the word of the Lord for you, both of you, the, your lives. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. I'm going to lay hands on you. That's okay. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for the fine year of 1956. Lord, that you birthed these two houses of prayer in that year. For the Lord says, I'm releasing a spirit of grace and supplication upon you in this hour for the lord says i've reserved my best wine for last the lord says expect an impartation of intercession that you not have never had before in your life for the lord says it is crunch time and i'm calling my houses of prayer to come forth for the lord says i'm lighting a fire within you and i'm stirring the embers of revival even in your heart says the lord and the lord says your house shall be not only a house of prayer but it shall be a house of flaming fire for the lord says the zeal of the lord shall consume you for there is a baptism of my fire that will release glory out of your being and the Lord says, I will not only cause you to be a house, but I will rescue your house and all that come within them. The Lord says, the house, the house, the house, I am sanctifying in this day and this hour. And the Lord says, your tears and your cries before me for your house, for your seed, for your generations have been heard. For the Lord says, there shall be a deluge of my spirit on the house, and I shall release the rivers of salvation in your house, the rivers of deliverance, the rivers of healing. And the Lord says, I will break a generational curse off of your families, and I will cause the blessing of the Lord to come as you intercede, as you cry out unto me, the Lord says, I will release strength in your heart and in your life to bring forth that which you've waited for. For truly, through faith and patience, you shall inherit the blessing, not only for you, but the Lord says, your house shall be called not only a house of prayer, but also a house of praise. For the Lord says, the joy of the Lord shall fill your house. The Lord says, days of mourning and weeping have come to an end. The Lord says, now are the, is the season of rejoicing for your household. So rejoice, my daughters. Embrace the spirit of grace for supplication shall come forth to bring the victory, says the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. You were born on the 7th. Yeah. Seven. Oh, the number seven, which is tough. Seven is what you read. Oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you were born on the okay. Praise God. Ooh. Amen. Amen. That was good. So, I saw something really strange during worship too. I saw um, it was like a red panic button. <laughs> and I don't know if that relates does anybody can relate to that there's like uh, maybe you've had some stress in your life here recently you feel like just like I'm going to hit the panic button <laughs> you know uh, is that you come on up come on Selena yeah 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 so this is what the what the Lord's showing me Selena I'm just going to give you this word the Lord says there is a there's warfare over your life right now because the Lord says you're turning a corner 
And the devil sees what is ahead. But the Lord says, know that my blood is sufficient for you to sanctify you. For the Lord says, you're moving into a new season. You're moving into a season of anointing. You're moving into a season of discovery. For the Lord says, I'm releasing not only the spirit of wisdom, but revelation. And the Lord says, I'm going to show you things to come. The fullness of my spirit shall come upon you. And the Lord says, you're going to begin to have dreams in the night. And the Lord says, you're going to know what those dreams mean. The Lord says, they'll come as it were as a picture. But the Lord says, I will give you an interpretation for those dreams. The Lord says, I paved a way for you. But the enemy's tried to trip you up even recently. He's tried to, 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 to cause stress in your life. But the Lord says, know that I've got a plan. And the Lord says, know that I'm greasing the skids and the oil of my spirit I'm pouring out upon you so that you will arise and shine and begin to pursue my destiny. The enemy will try to put a blindfold on you, but the Lord says, know that the eyes of your understanding shall be enlightened. You'll know the hope of my calling. The Lord says, you'll know the riches of your inheritance. And the Lord says, you will know the greatness of my power. For I'm going to release the spirit of might upon you. And the Lord says, you're going to go into areas and things. You're going to be able to do things that you didn't know you're going to be able to do. I want you to put up your hands right now. I'm just going to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for an impartation of might right now, God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your great grace. Thank you for your mercy, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness on this one. This one. The Lord says, the purity of your heart has consecrated yourself unto me. The Lord says, as you've dedicated your heart unto me in the secret place, the Lord says, know that my eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show myself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward me. And the Lord says, because you've got a loyal heart and because you have a humble heart, the Lord says, I'm going to hide you in the secret place. And the Lord says, I'm going to revive you. I'm going to cause a flame to be continual burn within your heart. Nope. And the Lord says, I'm going to anoint you with oil because you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Know that I'm going to anoint you with the oil of gladness more than your companions, says the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Just going to wait a minute. That's all right. Let's, let's uh, sing another song. Hallelujah. says, Daryl, you have pleased me because the Lord says you've been hid away in a secret place. The Lord says you have not pushed yourself forward. The Lord says you've waited. And the Lord says because you have a meek and quiet spirit, the Lord says know that it's pleasing to me. The Lord says because you have a, you've answered with a soft answer, know that the enemy's wrath shall not touch you. And the Lord says great grace is upon you because you've walked in humility before me. And the Lord says, know that I'm opening a door that no man can shut in the next season. Because you've gone through a silent season, you've been waiting for a door to open, and seemingly it just seems shut. But the Lord says, I'm turning the tide in your behalf. And the Lord says, I'm going to, be, I'm going to open a door that no man can shut, for great grace and favor is upon you. 
The Lord says, I've humbled those that have exalted themselves, but now it's time to exalt those who have humbled themselves. And the Lord says, I'm exalting you in this season. And the Lord says, because you have a heart of a child, the Lord says, you shall be called great in my kingdom. The Lord says, rest in me, for though many have abandoned you and many have left you, know that I stick closer to you even as a brother. And the Lord says, esteem the covenant of marriage that I've given unto you, for the Lord says, there is a bond there that will always be strong, and the Lord says, so never falter. And the Lord says, uh, even as you covenant unto your wife, the Lord says, know that I've made covenant with you. And the Lord says, because even at an early age you said yes to me, the Lord says, know that I'm going to bring the fullness of my spirit into your life. And the Lord says, you're going to find favor in places where you haven't. The Lord says, it's time. And the Lord says, because you've had faith and patience, the Lord says, you will inherit the promises that I've given unto you. The Lord says, there is a generational blessing that awaits you that has been forfeited in a former generation. The Lord says, claim the blessing of that generation past. For the Lord says, it is rich. And the Lord says, it's part of your inheritance. Claim your inheritance, says the Lord. And the Lord says, I'm even going to be provision for the vision that I've given unto you. The Lord says, those things have been held back, but no Lord, no more. The Lord says, this is a season of reaping. The Lord said, the camels are coming, the camels are coming. The Lord said, there is provision for you and for your house. And the Lord says, know that you've heard from me, for I am going to open and I'm turning the page. And you're going into the next chapter of your life, says the Lord. The Lord says, in days gone by, you've been overlooked. But the Lord says, I'm bringing you forward for such a time. He says, arise, my son, for my glory is risen upon you, says the Lord. Jesus, we consecrate and dedicate this time to you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this house. And we just ask your spirit to continually flow. Let the spirit of revelation flow in this house tonight. And I pray, oh God, that the spirit of might, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, let it rest upon your saints tonight. Let it rest upon them in fullness, O God. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen and Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Well, we're going to get right into the teaching. I'm going to cut right through it tonight because uh, we're going to have impartation and activation. And so, um, praise God. We're going to make some space here for Cindy, so we're just going to need to move some of this stuff over a little bit. This is the time. We got to see back there.
Oh, it's wonderful. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I said. That's, that's Can everybody see the TV screen? Yes. You can sit next to Lori. Okay. Right there. All right, so this, we're going to be starting session. This is part four. Well, that's really breezy, isn't oh, it? Oh, bring it on. Oh, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> right there's fine. Yeah. yeah, a little. Does it want me to spin it? No. No. No, it's fine. Ah. <laughs> okay. So this is part four. This is all in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So if you have your manual, we do have extra manuals over here. If you want to grab one, uh, go to page 61. Go to page 61 in your manual. And tonight we're going to be talking about dreams. Does anybody ever have any dreams? All right, so we're going to be talking about dreams, different types of dreams. You've probably been asking the Lord, are you speaking through my dreams? And so we're going to talk about three major types of dreams, actually more than that. But how many know <clears throat> that dreams can be demonic? They can be just natural or human dreams. You know, could be due to you maybe ate too much pizza the night before and you had a pizza dream. Or you could have a divine dream. Now, normally, if it's a demonic dream, they're dark. They're defiling, they're depressing, they're deceptive. A lot of times they can involve sexual sin, trauma, death, destruction. And a lot of times they'll produce terror in you and they're commonly referred to as a nightmare, right? Yeah. Alright, has anybody had a demonic dream where you were actually physically attacked by a demon? Anybody ever have one of those? We used to have them all the time. In fact, have you ever had a dream where the devil was choking you? And you were trying to say Jesus and you yes. just couldn't seem to get it out. <laughs> Anybody have one of those? Yes. All right. So that's a demonic dream. Amen. And sometimes, you know, the Lord allows demonic dreams so the believer knows what's coming against them. And usually if you're having a demonic dream... You're either doing something really right or you're doing something really wrong. <laughs> Alright, so that's the first type of dream. Another one is a natural dream. It's just the result of your of a human condition. It could be due to chronic physical or a mental condition that you have. Hormonal imbalance, diabetes, hypoglycemia, and use of certain pharmaceuticals will cause you to have crazy dreams. I remember one time uh, uh, somebody prescribed, what was it, Ambien? Mm -hmm. oh, to, yeah. to, to, to Kay. She took it one night mm -hmm. and she had the wildest, craziest dream she ever had in her life and yeah. she poured it all down the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> So natural dreams can also be produced by an impactful movie that you watched the night before, a traumatic event, or an uncommon common repetitive activity performed prior to bedtime. Let's say um, maybe you're doing something. Let me just give you an example. Sometimes we, we, we go to Cana. In fact, we're planning a trip right now to the Navajo Nation. We're going to be redecorating a church. But after spending eight hours a day, you know, putting up, you know, pictures and hanging curtains, you know, you go to bed that night, you're dreaming about yeah. hanging pictures, right? Or something like that. Yeah. All right, then we can have divine dreams, right? Those are the good dreams. A lot of times they have symbolism involved there. It will involve a lot of times your prophetic destiny, a divine warning, uh, an encounter with Jesus or angels, or even the great cloud of witnesses. Have you ever met somebody in a dream that had passed away? You have some of the people that met people that passed away. I, I know I, I did at one point. Um, but it says in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, it says, And it shall come to pass that after I pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and daughters shall prophesy, 
Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. I remember, this was probably about 10 years ago, I was visiting my brother in New Jersey, and we just began to compare notes, and I said, you know, I, I'm starting to, to dream more than I've ever dreamed before. And he says, well, that just means you're getting old. <laughs> right? Old men shall dream dreams. <laughs> I didn't think it was funny at the time. But. <laughs> so one of the other questions is, is my dream a warning, direction, or revelation from God? In Job chapter 33, verse 15, it says, In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, when slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction." In order to turn man from his deed and to conceal pride from man, he keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. So a lot of times, dreams will show you things to come. It'll be warnings about what is to come. And how many know he's talking about your spiritual ears? He says he opens the ears so he can instruct them. But he's not talking about your natural ears. He's talking about the ears of your spirit. How many know that your spirit man has eyes? Your spirit man has ears. The Bible says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching the innermost parts of the belly. So your spirit man is down here. When people say, I love God with all of my heart. And it's like, no, it's not this heart because this is just pumps the blood in your body. He's talking about your spirit man. When the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, he's talking about your spirit man. How many know that this blood pump can't trust God? But your spirit man can because... Faith is a spiritual commodity, amen? <coughs> and so that's where we trust God is in our heart. A lot of times God will give us what I call destiny dreams. The Bible says that without a vision, people perish, amen? Without prophetic vision, people die. How many know that hope deferred makes the heart sick? But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. So a lot of times God will give you dreams to set a mark for your life, amen? So he shows you where you're going with your destiny. A lot of times, God will reveal the contents of your book. How many know that each one of us has a book in heaven written about us? Uh, Psalm 139, verse 16. In your book, they all were written, the days you had fashioned for me, when yet there was none of them. So each one of us has a book in heaven that God wrote before time began. How many know that He saved us, and He called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, all right? Yeah. So the call that you have on your life was written in heaven before time began. So when people, you know, maybe have a baby laid in life, they say, well, you were an accident. How many know that God doesn't make any accidents? Amen. 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 Right. And so, uh, you know, he writes on the tablets of your, how many know that your scroll in heaven needs to be in your heart? So a lot of times God uses dreams to set a mark and write what is in heaven on the tablets of your spirit, man, so then you can press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus on your life. How many of you realize that? Yeah. So a mark's got to be set. You can't press toward the mark if the mark's never been set. So God sets the mark many different ways. He does it through prophetic ministry. He uses the, uh, the word, but he also uses dreams to set marks for our lives. Amen? Now let me give you a couple of examples. Remember... Joseph, as a 17-year-old young man, had a couple of dreams that he probably shouldn't have shared with his brothers. <laughs> Amen? Genesis 37, verse 7. There we were, binding sheaves in a field. Then behold, my sheep arose and stood above and upright. And indeed, your sheep stood all around and bound down to my sheep. Now, how many know that's not, that kind of a dream is not going to go over very well with your family members? So, how many know that not everybody is as zealous about your dream? They may be jealous, but they may not be zealous for your dream. Amen? So, sometimes it's better not to share those dreams. All right, then God also warns, uh, warns with dreams, or warning dreams. So if you look in the book of Matthew, in chapter 1 and 2, four different times, the Lord gave Joseph dreams to protect baby Jesus. Four times he said he warned him in a dream. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Well, while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. 
And another one, Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. I think we need to move ahead on this. On the, uh, yeah, we need to move ahead on these. Uh, there was destiny dreams. Let's go back and look at destiny dreams. Destiny dreams. Let's go. Let's see. All right, destiny dreams. Praise God. All right. So this is what we were just talking about about the sheaves. And uh, let's go next to the warning dreams. Okay, Matthew chapter two, verse thirteen. Now when they departed, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there while I, until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. In another case, Matthew chapter 2, just a few verses later, verse 19 and 20. Now when Herod was dead, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, go to the land of Israel. For those who had sought the young man's life or young child's life are dead. Then, then two verses later, another dream. When he had heard, uh, I can't even pronounce the name of this guy, Ar Archelaus, who knows, <laughs> was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there. But being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside to the region of Galilee. So four different times in just the first two chapters of Matthew, God used dreams to warn, warn Joseph. How many know that God will use them to warn you? He'll show you things, even for your children a lot of times. He'll show you, hey, you know, I just had this dream, and he's giving you instructions how to protect your children, stuff like that. All right. Then there's revelation dreams. Revelation dreams <laughs> reveal scripture, reveal things about heaven, the kingdom of God, and the character of God can be revealed through a divine dream. Let me give you an example. Remember when Peter uh, went into a divine trance. He went into a vision into trance, and um, he he uh, there was a a sheep that came down, and there was all these unclean animals, and he heard a voice say, "Slay and eat." And he said, Nay, no, Lord. <laughs> I will not eat what is unclean. Amen. But through that vision, in that trance or that dream he was having, God was instructing him that the gospel was for the Gentiles also, not just for the Jews. How many of you know? I forgot, I did a study on this, but like for several years, they thought that the gospel was only for Jews. And he got this revelation no, it's for Gentiles too. Yeah. And uh, so that's another, he got revelation knowledge through dreams. Sometimes you can get revelation scripture through, through dreams. All right, so can you interpret your dreams from God? Sometimes uh, God gives us dreams uh, and visions that are parables. Remember, Jesus used to teach in parables. Why does he do that? Because Proverbs 25, 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter... But it is the glory of kings to search out a matter. Some things he doesn't make this relevant, you know, plain. He, you got to search out. You have to mind the scriptures. You have to mind the heart of God. He wants you to search him, seek after him, to find out what the meaning is. He just doesn't throw his pearls before the swine. He, he wants you to search his scripture and meaning like hidden treasure. How many know that we're priests and kings unto our God? So it's the kingly nature of God in you that makes you want to search out the matter. You want to search the heart of God. What does this mean? That's where the deep riches of revelation of Scripture and what God's calling, maybe not only a, your, as a person, but your family, a church, a city. He brings revelation as we seek after Him. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Genesis 41.12 talks about Joseph. He said there was a young Hebrew man, Joseph, there, a servant of the captain of guard. And we told him he interpreted our dream for us. So each man interpreted according to his own dream. So God also gives you gifts of interpretation of dreams. Kay and I, uh, you know, I don't want to advertise this because then everybody's going to be coming to us with their dreams. <laughs> but at different times, people share their dreams with us and God gives us the interpretation of, of, of what it means because he wants you to know what those dreams are. But a lot of times, you need to search out, search it out. Amen. Same with Daniel, chapter 1, verse 17. Uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these four men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. 
See, this is what happens uh, when, when, when the spirit of knowledge comes on you. How many know that the spirit's not, a spirit of knowledge will show you what God wants to do? He will show you what He wants, to, wants you to do in your life. And the spirit of counsel will show you how and when God wants to do it. That's why the seven spirits of God are so important. Those are all aspects of the Holy Spirit. We should all know them right now, right? We should know them by now. The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Wisdom, uh, the, the Spirit of uh, Understanding, the Spirit of uh, Counsel and Might, Spirit of Knowledge, and of the Fear of the Lord. Amen? So all those seven spirits of God have different aspects uh, in them. But God wants to reveal those things for you, to you. So the Spirit of Wisdom reveals the ways of God. The spirit of understanding or revelation reveals the Word of God and the works of God. Amen? The spirit of knowledge reveals to you what God wants to do. The spirit of counsel reveals to you how and when God wants to do it. The spirit of counsel reveals the plans of God. Amen? The spirit of counsel and might work together. Because when you get the counsel of the Lord, how He wants to do things, and you act upon it, God releases His might to carry it out. Just like in Joshua and Jericho. He gave him a detailed plan. The Spirit of Counsel said, How are we going to take this city? He said, Well, here's what you're going to do. You're going to march around the city once for six days. And then on the seventh day, you're going to march around seven times. We're going to have these priests blow these trumpets. And then everybody's going to yell and scream. And the walls are going to come down. See, He gave him the Spirit of Counsel, the plan of God on how and when to carry out his yeah. plan. And what happened? The spirit of might was released and all the walls fell down. There's been numerous examples in the Bible, but yeah. I just thought I'd bring that up. All right. So anybody want to know about five steps to, to dream interpretation? Yes. yes. All right. All right. So number one, here's some pre- very practical steps. When you have a dream, the first thing you need to determine, who is the dream for? Yeah. Most of the time, the dream is for you. But usually, and uh, God will also give you a dream for somebody that you're responsible for, you're an accountable for, or you're in covenant with. Okay? So, God will give you dreams that apply to your children. Things you need to do for your children. He'll also bring you dreams for your family members and stuff like that. And even in a church, when we're in covenant with our members in the church, even in the last month, we've had two or three members come to us with strategic dreams about church, this church and what's going to happen. So encouraging. So encouraging. So God will do that uh, to encourage you. Amen? All right. Let me see what we got here. A lot of times if you're a prophet or you're an intercessor, you may have dreams that um, have a, a message for a city, a state, and if you have influence in the government, he will, just like uh, like Daniel and Joseph, they had audiences with the king a lot of times. God will give you uh, interpretations if you are operating at that level to be able to give guidance even to government uh, leaders. And we've seen that happen before as well. Um, all right. So number one, determine your recipient. Number two, Highlight the main points of the dream. This is very important. Seek the Lord about the central meaning of the dream without getting too bogged down in extraneous details. A lot of times when I listen to a dream, there's key things in that dream we'll just pick out. That's important. That's important. That's not important. This is important. That's important. (laughs) And there will be a thread. There will be a theme. And you'll see, you you know, you can pick it out. Be able to prophetically be able to pick out certain things that stand out in those dreams. And important part number three is to correctly interpret symbols. All right, the interpretation of symbols, the hidden meaning of actions, colors, animals, directions, names, numbers, objects. Sometimes there's good symbol books out there will tell you that what things mean. It will give you a, an idea. Just like if you see a a car or you see an airplane, it's a vehicle for like a ministry or a movement. A lot of times uh, when people see like K, many people seeing dreams for K uh, with white horses. We've had white horses appear in our sanctuary several times over the last seven years. And the white horse speaks of a movement, a move of God. And, and, and so when that horse shows up, you get on the horse. <laughs> oh, there's a nice horse. 
No, you mount that horse because he needs a rider. Yes. The movement yes. needs a rider. How many of you know that? Yes. You know. Yes. How many of you know that also, this is kind of this is more about visions, but how how many of you know that when we're all in the spirit and we're pray, like in some of our prayer meetings, somebody will have a vision and they'll begin to tell you the vision. How many of you know if you're all in the spirit together, you can step into that vision? Yeah, that's right. And you can see something, maybe that person that's having a vision, you can actually step into it. And you, be, you can enter in the vision. In case, this has happened with Pastor Kay several times, where they ended up in the same place and they were seeing the exact same thing. And it, it, It's in the spirit world, but it can be very effective um, to be able to see. Now, how many of you know with visions, if you're going to see, you've got to take a look? Okay. Yeah. 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 Right? You gotta take a look, but you're gonna see just like you can't just hear, you've got to listen. Right, right. Okay, you got you you can hear, but if you're not listening, you won't hear anything. You gotta listen. To see, you gotta take a look. You gotta look to see. Does that make sense? Yeah. That means you've got to be asking God for it. Just like when you get these services, I um I'm inquiring of the Lord. I'm like, what are you what are you doing? What are you saying? And you open your ears to hear what God's saying, and that's where you get these words of knowledge. It's where you get words of wisdom, and things like that. Because the Bible says to pursue love. Say with me, pursue love, pursue love. and earnestly covet spiritual gifts, but rather you may prophesy. Yeah. Now, I was just reading First Corinthians uh, twelve and thirteen. Uh, I think it was this morning. I was reading that, and he just kept highlighting pursue love. We need uh, the edification of the church has got to be our motivation. Jesus was moved with compassion. He healed the sick. He was moved with compassion and he fed. So compassion and love have to be the motivation of moving out in spiritual gifts. So pursue love and earnestly covet spiritual gifts, but rather you may prophesy. So you've got to ask God for those gifts every day. I ask God, use me in the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, gifts of healing, gifts of faith, working of miracles, all these gifts. You ask for it. You have not because you ask not. We, we, we've been to churches before and they said, what do you believe in spiritual gifts? And they say yes, but there's no spiritual gifts operating. Why? Because there's di a difference between a belief and a value. You can believe in something, but when you value it, you actually operate in it. Right. Okay? Good point. Yeah. You, you can say, oh, do you believe in this? Well, we believe in it, but there's nothing happening. So we have to value those things. If you value, you're going to put your time and your energy into it. Right. All right. So correctly interpret symbols. Number four, play, pay attention to co uh, consecutive or recurring dreams, especially if you have a recurring dream. Mm -hmm. oh, you know, you have, that, uh, you have that dream over and over and over again. God's getting a message to you. And, you, and I remember this one lady. We, we were in Sierra Vista, Arizona. This was probably 15 years ago or more. Mm -hmm. Kay and I were down there doing some prophetic class or something down there. And... Um, we were going to do some dream interpretation. Well, this lady comes to us. She said, I had this recurring dream for the last 10 years, and nobody can tell, you, tell us what it means. And she told us in just in minutes, we, we told exactly what it meant. She was flabbergasted, you know. She was just, but so anytime you have a recurring dream, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's very important that God's wanting to get across. All right. Number five, journal your dream. Sometimes a dream may not make sense right away. You ever get a prophecy and it's like, well, I don't know what that means. <laughs> you know, write it down. And a lot of times, in a few weeks or a few months, it's like, oh, I understand what that dream means. It'll make sense. So don't despise prophesying, amen, and dreams that maybe don't make sense. Go ahead and write it down and then revisit. Take a look at it later. There's a couple dreams I had in this manual. I'm not going to have time to go over that because I want to make sure we have time for activation tonight. Um, but let's go into prophetic proclamations and prayers. Let's go to the next slide. Priestly prayers. How many know that we are priests and kings unto our God? First Peter 2, verse 5 says that you are living stones, being built a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Say it with me, holy priesthood. Holy priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, he may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So over the past 500 years, we have been very developed in praying, because that's what priests do. We pray. And so for the last 500 years, we have been taught to pray. Now this is very important. 
But prayer in its rudimentary or elementary form is a plea or a petition to God for something that we cannot realize or accomplish without divine assistance. Amen? So, we start off with priestly praying, but God wants us to move into kingly proclamations. Amen? So we are priests and kings unto our God. So there's an aspect of praying that we understand, but then we need to move into kingly proclamations or declarations. Amen? We have the anointing and ministry of kings, and as kings, we are our role is to expand the reign of Christ in the earth. We have a mandate of dominion that was originally given to Adam, given to the saints, that is to be executed through proclamation, through your mouth, proclaiming. Amen? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, Jesus, or the Lord, said to Adam, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion. How many know that God never relinquished His dominion mandate? Right. Amen? Right. Now the devil took the keys out of Adam's hand. He gave his authority away. But how many know that all authority has been given back to us because Jesus died on the cross. Amen? Amen. Right. And he got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And he's now given us the authority as kings unto our God. Now we just need to exercise it. Amen? Amen. Revelation 5.10 He's made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign. There is creative and destructive power released through proclamation. Proverbs 18.21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. How many know there's creative power in making declarations? When the Lord created the earth, He created the earth with words. Amen? Yep. Amen. Right. What did He say? Let there be light, and there was light. Did you know that literally means light be? He spoke it into existence. There was a proclamation. He made a command. He made a proclamation. How many know that kings don't ask? They don't make requests. Kings decree. They give commands. There's an aspect of the kingly anointing that we need to move into if we're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders and a harvest that God, that, that Jesus died for. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. Romans 4.17 says, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Amen? So that's where faith is generated out of a heart and a kingly anointing that sees, speaks it. It sees it in the spirit, speaks it, and brings it into the natural. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yeah. So when you make a proclamation in faith, of something you don't see, but God desires and you desire, you have to speak it into existence to make it come forth. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's talk about prophetic proclamations. You see, kingly proclamations can only be effective in enforcing Jesus' objectives when the will of God is known. How many of you know you need to know what the will of God is in the situation before you just speak it? Amen? Because we have to come in alignment with heaven. This is where the prophetic aspect of proclamations comes into being. Prophetic revelation and insight into the will of God is crucial before we make proclamations. So we, what do we look at? We look at the prophecy of Scripture. And we look at prophecy as it's authored by the Holy Spirit. That should be our foundation from which we declare kingdom proclamations. Prophetic proclamations have heaven's divine authorization or seal of approval because they originate in the heart of the Father. Amen? So we know that David and Jesus operated in the anointing and the office of the prophet, priest, and king. All three of those offices, Jesus and David operated into. Therefore, their kingly proclamations and priestly prayers were infused with prophetic destiny that is necessary to catalyze their fulfillment. How many know you got to come in alignment with what God's saying before you pray, come in alignment with heaven, before you proclaim, because you want to be in alignment with heaven, right? Amen. So if you look at Psalm 2, Psalm 2 
contains a prophetic proclamation or a decree regarding the reign of Jesus. And it's on your screen. Psalm 2, verse 6. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. This is the Father speaking here. I will declare the decree. He didn't say a decree. He said the decree. Say with me, the decree. The decree. The Lord has said to me, He said, this is Jesus speaking here. He said, the Lord has said to me, You are my son. I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. So this was a decree that he was to speak. This was the decree. Jesus is looking for an inheritance. He is looking not just for a salvation of a few people. He is looking for the salvation of the nations. The reward of his suffering is just not a meager harvest. It is a mass harvest, and we haven't seen it yet. Okay, So don't settle for second best. Everybody's waiting for Jesus to come. God's waiting for us to occupy till he comes. Amen? He's come back for a glorious church, not a church hiding, cowering in a corner, just waiting for Jesus to come back. No, he is looking for a a holy and spotless bride yeah. equipped and armed to the teeth yes. that's beat the devil's tail into yes. the ground. Yes. Yes. Not a church yeah. that the devil's running out on a rail yeah. waiting. You see what I'm saying? Yes. We don't have the spirit of fear. We have the spirit of power and might. Why? Yeah. Because we are His change agents. Yeah. Amen? He said to have dominion. He's not really ever relinquished that. Right. Jesus is looking for a victorious church. Yes. Amen? Yes. A victorious church, not a wimpy church. Yes. That's right. That's right. Yep. So we got to start acting like it. Amen? Yes. Not cowering yes. in a corner. We need to arise and shine. Mm -hmm. yep. Arise and shine. Come out of your cave yes. of resignation. Come out of your cave of intimidation. Amen? Amen. Arise and shine because Isaiah 60 is coming. And it's coming yes. for this state. Yes. 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 For the next yes. couple of years, you're going to see Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Yes. Gross darkness shall cover the earth yes. and its people, but my glory shall rise upon my church. Yes. 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 And kings Amen. and Gentiles will come to the brightness of your rising, your rising, and your rising. Amen? Amen. Amen. His glory is rising and rising. He's come yes. for a glorious church. Yes. Amen? Yes. Not a fear-filled church running yes. and hiding. We said, oh, everything's getting worse. Well, you need to open your eyes in the Spirit. Yes. Just like yes. Elisha's servant. Oh my gosh, look at all of these warriors. Look at all these men. Lord, open his eyes. Open his yes. eyes. Open his eyes. Yes. And let him see there are more with us than yes. with him. Yes. We are a company of angels that are around about us. Yes. Amen? Yes. Yes. Amen? I remember uh, this guy had a vision. He went to a church. He was visiting a church and he saw a couple angels. And he heard us standing around. And the guy spoke to the angels. He goes, what are you doing? He said, not much. <laughs> so you got to put your angels to work. And now, we made a declaration over this state and over the city. We said, Lord, any idle angels out there, bring them to prepare the way. Bring them here. We're put them to work. We need healing angels. We need deliverance angels. We need harvest angels. And we're going to put these angels to work. And you know how you put them to work? You pray in tongues. You pray in tongues. The Bible says if I speak in the tongues of men and even of angels. Amen. So why do you have, why does he ever speak in the tongues of angels? Because angels hearken unto the voice of the word of the Lord. So when you pray in tongues of angels, you're actually engaging, engaging angels to operate and begin doing things. Pushing back darkness, healing the sick. Amen. Amen. Is that a revelation? Yes. <laughs> yes. I love that revelation. <laughs> God's raising a standard. He's equipped us. Don't minimize speaking in tongues. Amen. Even that prophetic word that came forth tonight. He's wondering why there was no intercessor. And now he's given us the ability to pray in tongues, praying the perfect will of God. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. For we do not know how we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, for he makes intercession according to the will of God. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Right. So when you pray in tongues, you're praying the perfect will of God. 
Amen. Amen. Can't get any better than that. And that's the standard the Lord is raising yeah. in this yeah. hour. That's going to, in the coming year, that's going to be so important. Praying in tongues. That's coming in a message very soon. Amen. All right. Now I'm getting off. I'm getting off into some stuff. All right. Prophetic prayers. Jesus is a prophet, priest, and a king. And how many know he gave a high priestly prayer in the book of John? John chapter 17, verse 20. He prayed this prayer. That they may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. That they may be all be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you have given me, I have given them. Why did he give us the glory, church? He said, I'm giving you the glory. He tells us that they may be one. How many of you know that glory is the atmosphere of heaven? Amen. He said He gave us the glory. When you enter into the atmosphere of heaven, how many know there is no strife in heaven? There's no hypocrisy in heaven? There's no discrimination in heaven? Right? There's none of that. He gave us the glory that we would be one. God erases all of that in the glory. So we can be one. Amen? Amen. I, them, and you and me, that the world may know that I that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Now listen to this last prayer. Father, I desire that they, also whom you gave me, listen now, may be with me where I am. He's not talking about when you die. He's talking about right now. Yeah. Hmm. Not that they would be in heaven one day in the sweet by and by. He says, no, that they may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Amen. 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 That's where we need to live. How I many know we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? Not just we need to experience that. Not just know it up here. We need to experience it. We need to make it a reality for our lives. And we're all responsible to do that. To enter into that secret place. To behold His glory. That we would be one. Alright, let's move on to prophetic signs. A lot of times God will use prophetic signs as parables commun a, communicate a divine message. Matthew 13, 13. Therefore I speak to them in parables. Because seeing me they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. See, a lot of times, the Lord did, Jesus, when He taught, He just didn't spell it out. He spoke in parables. Because you had to have a listening ear to understand what He was saying. Yeah. Just the Pharisees and said, what is He talking about? <laughs> That's why He said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He wasn't talking about these ears. We all got these ears. He who has ears, what? Spiritual ears. Yes. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. What the Spirit of God is saying. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Alright. There's a lot of examples here about Jeremiah and Ezekiel that God used them in signs. In fact, Ezekiel's whole life was a sign. Ezekiel 24, 24 on your screen. Thus Ezekiel is a sign to you according to all that he has done you shall do. And when he comes, you shall know that I am the Lord God. The Lord made him eat bread cooked by fire fueled with cow dung. <laughs> made him cut off his hair and beard with a sword. Even his wife was taken away from him. I'm glad I'm not an Old Testament prophet. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about is God speaking through my alarm clock? <laughs> again, again, last night, uh, this morning, I woke up at 444. Yes. It's <laughs> yes. so all the one new sound. How many know there's a lot of warfare over the over worship yes. right now? Yeah. Yeah. Since it's the one new sound that's going to break the glass ceiling over yep. Arizona. There's yeah. a lot of warfare over worship. Yeah. Amen? It sure is. Numbers are important to the Lord. Psalm yeah. 58, 56, verse 8. You number my wanderings. Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? Psalm 90, verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So we know that numbers generally mean things. Some common numbers. Uh, the number five represents grace. Everybody pretty much knows that. Mm -hmm. The number six represents man. Mm -hmm. The number seven is divine perfection. Number eight, new beginnings. The number 12 represents divine government. And so... We find that there are scriptures and things that God God speaks to me with numbers all the time. That's primarily how He speaks to me through numbers. I get numbers all the time. Yeah. Uh, mainly my alarm clock, 
uh, sometimes dates. Uh, a lot of times hotel room numbers. We'll have guests come in, we'll put them in rooms, what room number are you? And it will be some scripture, and God will end, they'll end up preaching on, on that scripture. Mm -hmm. Or there will be a theme to that conference based on the scripture, what hotel room they're in. A lot of times that will happen. Um, street street house numbers. Restaurant numbers. You go to, um, I, I look at this stuff all the time because God speaks to me. If you go to uh, like Culver's and you get your number. <laughs> 60, Isaiah 60, praise God. <laughs> Even license plate numbers, odometer readings. I remember, um, I w this was probably 10 years ago, I was, we were having some problems with one of our kids, and um, I went to Arby's, I was driving to Arby's, and um, I stopped, and I look at my odometer, we were going to pick up the food, and the odometer was it was an old car, 226-000. And right away I knew it was Proverbs 22-6. Train up a child in the way he should go when he's old and not the car for <laughs> You know, Amen. stuff like that. The most prophetic thing that's ever happened with numbers with me was, um, so make a long story short, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5. Um is the banner scripture over my life. I received that scripture when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, June 29th of 1986. Or actually, yeah, that's right. And uh, so that was the prophetic word. So that's been my banner scripture, Isaiah 40, uh, verses 3 to 5. So anyway, about this was about, how long ago was that, honey? About 15 years ago? Yeah. We ended up renting a house in Anthem, Arizona. And uh, so we get all moved in. And for some reason, I just happened to have my Bible. We just got done moving in. We went to the Walmart up there, and we ate a Subway sandwich. We were sitting there. And I had my Bible, and the Lord begins to speak to me. And he says, um, what, what's the house number that you just moved into? I said, well, it's 40325. <laughs> West Graham, uh, North Graham Way. It ended up being the exact passage, Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. <laughs> We moved in there. <laughs> it's amazing stuff. Even like uh, if you get like 316, it's an evangelistic calling. 333. Mm -hmm. three, three. How many of you ever see uh, Jeremiah 333? Three, 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 three. You see 333 three, three a lot? Revelation, Divine Destiny, Jeremiah 333. Three, three, right? Uh, 418. Luke 418, a fresh anointing. 555, season of multiplied grace. You see these numbers. 714, call to repentance. Second Chronicles 714. How many see 1010? I just saw 1010 like twice in, oh, before I went to bed last night, 1010, and then I woke up at 444. I did go back to sleep though. 1010, John 1010. The thief cometh not for to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you may have what? Life and have it more abundantly. How about 1111? How many of us the awakening number? 1111. How many see 1111? We got John 1111. We got Revelation 1111. We got Isaiah 1111. These are all scriptures about awakening and revival. Amen? How many see 1212? 1212. It's all about divine government order. Anyway, I could talk all night about this stuff, kind of stuff. All right. But I'm going to wrap it up here in about 10. Hold me to it, about 10 or 12 minutes. All right, so let's talk about other different aspects of prophetic ministry, prophetic music, song, dance, drama, poetry. A lot of times these visual aids embed a prophetic message into your heart. Mm -hmm. How many know that music can actually increase the prophetic anointing? Yeah. You can actually increase it, and then you got music and decrease it. Yep. Right. Amen. Second yep. Kings chapter 3, verse 15. Elisha said, Now bring me a musician. And it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. So when the right music's playing, it, it lends itself to the prophetic flow. How many of there's a river we can all get in? There's a river of prof prophetic you, you can yeah. flow uh, that comes with music. First Chronicles 25, 1 and 3. Moreover, David and the captains of the army separated for the service of some of Asaph, he, he man, <laughs> and Jonathan, who should prophesy with harps string instruments and cymbals. And the sons of Jedithan, under the direction of their father, who prophesied with the heart to give thanks and praise to the Lord. So how many know that actually when you're praying instruments, 
somehow it pr produces a prophetic melody that that actually makes a statement in the spirit realm. You can do that with music. Yeah. Anything that with sound yeah. can be prophetic yeah. that actually does something. Sometimes we don't understand what it does. We just do it. Yeah. Right? right? All right. So prophetic ministry also goes to demonstrate through song, dance, drama, poetry. Remember Miriam? She did a prophetic dance. Uh, when, when the Red Sea parted, they did this dance with timbrels and all that. So when they did that, it embedded in people's mind. They'll never forget it. They'll never forget it. Uh, a lot of times, illustrated sermons, they get a, the point across, right? There's been times I, I preach with a gavel, preach with a horn of oil, preach with a rod of iron, a sword, and even a whistle. Anytime you use a prophetic prop, a lot of times they'll get your message across so people remember. Does that make sense? All right. We're going to talk about prophetic evangelism. This is going to go really quick. How many of you enjoying this so far? Yes. Yes. Right. So in the church is commonly where we see people get born again. But how many know you can use prophetic ministry actually to get people saved? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 24. He says, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is judged by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So I have actually seen this uh, work in a church where somebody was called out that did not know the Lord. But after they received the prophecy, they got saved because it's like, no, no, it's no way that person mm -hmm. could have known that. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. So you can actually operate in that. But how many of you know that when that happens, when... Uh, that is more than prophecy operating. It's actually the gift of the word of knowledge or the word of wisdom operating, writing on the gift of prophecy. Prophecy is the delivery system. Yeah. The word of knowledge reveals a person's past and their current situation. A word of wisdom reveals the future. I'm going to know the Bible says when the Holy Spirit comes, He'll lead you and guide you into all truth. He will tell you things to come. That's the future. So that's how that works. So when you prophesy... But prophesying is the delivery system to edify, encourage, and exhort, and comfort people. But it usually operates with words of knowledge and words of wisdom. How many of those gifts all work together? Yes. Okay. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Anyway. All right. But God also wants to use the gift of the Spirit in the world. We're going to give you one prime example, and then we're going to close it up. And if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to John chapter 4. Or you can just look in your notes. Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4 is uh, an encounter similar to if you were to meet somebody at the grocery store or meet somebody at the mall or something like that. So he goes to the Samaritan well and in John chapter 4 um, he meets this woman. In fact, look, can I use my Bible, sweetie? Yes. Thank you. I know you were reading there. <laughs> so a woman verse 7 a woman of Samaria came to draw water Jesus said to her give me a drink for the disciples have gone away into the city then the woman said to him how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me a Samaritan woman for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans so what what is some that would be used in common terminology today, instead of saying that, they would say, why are you talking to me? Christians have no dealings with sinners. See, that's kind of the understanding that sinners have, that Christians are too good for them, they won't talk to them. But how many of you, we need to break that paradigm, right? Yes. We need to break that paradigm. We do have something to do with them. All right. So the Lord begins talking to him uh, about this living water. And Jesus said in verse 16, Jesus said, Go call your husband and come here. And she says, I have no husband. And Jesus, see, using the word of knowledge, he said, You have said, Well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one whom you are with now is not your husband. This you have truly spoken. What did she say? Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Mm -hmm. But what would they say today? They would say, 
You must be psychic. (laughs) And it really is an indictment on the church when our culture equates prophetic gifting with psychic ability than true prophetic anointing. Amen? And how many know God's going to reverse that? He's going to reverse that. Why? Because we just don't want a word of knowledge. We want the spirit of knowledge resting on us. Just like Jesus had the spirit, all the seven spirits of God resting on him. We need to have the spirit of knowledge resting on us because when it rests on us, we won't just have a word of knowledge. We'll have a stream of knowledge about someone. And this is exactly what happened in this passage with Jesus. And so, she goes on to say, John chapter 4, let's look at verse 28. The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things I ever did. How many things? All. All things. All in the Spanish, Hebrew, Greek, German, and French. All means what? All. All. All things that are did. So he just didn't tell her about the five husbands. He went into details about her life. She said, could this be the Christ? Nobody's ever done this before, what he's doing. Then they went out to the city and came to him. He told such details that she convinced them that this is the Christ. So they all went to see him. Amen? All right. So it goes on to say, In John 4, 35, Jesus said, There are still four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look for the hills, for they are white for harvest. So, here's the thing. There's a harvest of people out there. The whole problem is, and I know when I worked in the everyday world, I wasn't thinking a lot about how I'm going to minister to somebody. I was busy, and we need to be busy on our job. Don't get me wrong. But every now and then, God will give you a word of knowledge for somebody, maybe in your workplace, that would get them saved. Mm-hmm. Amen. I remember one time, I was raised Catholic, and my parents got born again uh, after I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Because they, you know, when I when I found out I spoke in tongues, they went and talked to the priest, and they said they were anyway they were frightened for me. So my dad began to look into what's all this speaking in tongues business. So they ended up <laughs> becoming charismatic Catholics. And, I can tell you some stories about charismatic Catholics. <laughs> I remember he he went to um, he went to some healing service that one of John Wimber's people was running, and they were teaching these Catholics about uh, you know the gifts of the Spirit. And so the guy running the thing he says, "Does anybody have a pain in their body anywhere in their body?" My dad goes, "Yeah, I do." He says, "I got a pain in my heart right now." All of a sudden. He goes, that's a word of knowledge. So he says, Did anybody else in this place have chest pains right now? And a couple people come up and this one, he goes, well, all right, I need you, which speaking to my dad, to pray for this woman. And this is, this is my dad's account of it. He goes, I laid hands on this woman and she crumbled. <laughs> <laughs> so later, like uh, I think a few months later, a year later, he goes to work and some, some, some person uh, had a, a, a knee problem, a really short knee. And my dad didn't even greet the guy. He just walked over to him and put his hands on his knee and walked away. <laughs> and the guy got healed. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> Funny stuff. I mean, you know, there's opportunities. Out. I can, I don't, I'm not going to have time to do it, but I can tell you some more examples. And we'll stuff. stay an extra hour. Stay next hour. Well, we got activation, so you will be here another hour. You will. <laughs> so anyway, so so Jesus goes back, or, or no, they came out to him, and it says in John four thirty nine. Listen, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the woman, the word of the woman who testified. He told me all I ever did. Verse forty. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. He stayed there two days. Now listen, verse 41. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. 
Now notice in this passage of scripture, there was no healings, there was no demonic deliverance, no, simply through the operation of the word of knowledge, the spirit of knowledge resting on him, he began to tell intimate details about all of their lives in the men of the city over two days, who knows how long, but he was telling things about them, and they all believed he was the Christ. Isn't that a powerful way to evangelize? Amen, I think God's setting a mark for us here. Amen? All right. So we need to be the light of the world. We need to be the salt of the earth. So using that gift of the word of knowledge is another one way. There's power evangelism. There's healing evangelism. There's all different types of evangelism. But um, the prophetic evangelism through the word of knowledge, that's another option to win souls for Jesus Christ. How many of you enjoy that? Yeah. Yes. All right. Great job. Right on time. So we're going to go move into our activation. And so um, we're going to... If it's okay, Apostle Francis. Apostle Francis, go ahead and stand up. Apostle Francis, he's our director of our uh, ministry team. And so he leads our team. So all of our um, ministry team leaders are assigned to groups. And so we're going to put groups where we normally don't put them. Usually we're in a sanctuary. But um, we hope you can stay. Can you stay for like 45 minutes to yes. do this activation? Yes. So, what are, so what, what, here's what we're going to do. I think this is probably the best way to do it. We actually, some of you are going to get to go into our offices. So we're going to have, um, is it okay if I just assign the groups to different places? Okay, so group one is going to be in my 